thank you all for coming in. I appreciate it standing room only. This is awesome. We're going to have to have a bigger venue next year. Uh, and everybody's having conversations. If you could keep it down for our talk, please. Thank you. I have the pleasure of introducing the talks at the Data Duplication Village. This is the first time we've had talks this year, and I love seeing your response. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, and I also have the pleasure of introducing this individual, Andy Klein, from Backblaze. Uh, we have been paying close attention to the reports that he has been generating for the past several years, what, four years now? Yeah, four years on a quarterly basis, he's been generating reports for the hard drive and putting them out for society, for the community, to be able to take advantage of, especially us, so we can see what happens in the way of failures and drives to look for. So without further ado, Andy, thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you, Scott. Much appreciated. All right, so uh, they did let me in here with a title of marketing, um, so I don't know how that happened. I snuck in under the radar. Uh, I, I actually do, a long time ago, I actually coded for a living. I played systems administrator for a while uh, and all of that, and then I crossed over to the dark side and became a marketing person. Uh, the good part is, is I'm hard to bluff um, from a technical point of view, but I still am a marketing person. Um, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. All right, so a little bit about, I have to do this. We're gonna to talk today a little bit about our environment, so all about drives and stuff like that, right? Um, how we measure a failure, all right, because we do that. I'll walk you through some of the stats we have, and then we'll do some fun stuff like uh, look at enterprise drive versus consumer drives, uh, and helium drives versus airfield drives, uh, and a little bit about the idea of can you actually predict failure on a hard drive? All right, if you have enough statistics and enough numbers, you can predict anything. And this, we'll finish up with temperature. Uh, just so you know, for those of you who know Backblaze, um, this was the original storage pod we built. Okay, uh, for those in the back, that's plywood. Okay. Uh, that's how we prototyped the first one. You can see it up on the rack over there uh, in with that lovely little piece of Dell equipment, which cost nine times as much, by the way. Um, so uh, we built that, and then we eventually changed it into those pretty red ones um, that uh, we'll talk about in a few minutes. So our environment. And it's important that you understand our environment just a little bit because people look at this, the data sometimes, and they go, oh, that's not how my system is, and this is it and I have two drives and one failed and you guys don't know what you're talking about. Okay, this is our environment. It's a data center, uh, 60 drives in a chassis. There are now systems with up to 100 drives in a 4U chassis, right? Uh, but that's how we do it. And then we actually logically group together 20 of them, 20 of those chassis into something called a vault. So when a, a file comes in, it actually gets sharded across those 20 different chassis, right? Uh, so that way we can lose because of the way this is done with our own, we, it's a, we, we created our own encoding, erasure code stuff, a mechanism. And we actually open sourced it, by the way, so go to GitHub, you can look it up uh, if you wanna steal it, excuse me, borrow it, uh, excuse me, make it better. Um, uh, it, it's out there for you guys to look at. Um, it's, uh, but it's a, it's a, um, Excuse me, 17 3 encoding mechanism. So you can lose up to three, three whole systems uh, before you lose anything, any data. Um, and long before that ever happens, okay, we're, we're way ahead of that, okay? Um, but drives fail. And this is the kind of mechanism you have to build when you want to scale the system, right? Um, and because drives do fail. And we'll see a little bit later how many, okay? Right now we're storing about 600 petabytes of data, so just slightly more than came in the last few days. But I am amazed. By the way, these guys deserve a hell of a hand, okay? If, if they do an amazing job to get all of this stuff replicated for you guys, for anyone who's doing that. So I think that's the first thing we do. Let's give them a hand, okay? Uh, because it is, it is hard to maintain all of this, and then they have the little failed drives over there and they're keeping track, it's kind of fun. Uh, we have more than 100,000 drives um, that are in operation right now. Um, so, and we stick them in those wonderful red chassis, right? And that's, that's us, okay? 
Now, you've probably seen this shot on the internet because everybody loves to say, look at a data center, and it's all pretty and red, right? Uh, little story. The reason they're red was because when we did the very first one and built it, the guy called us and said, what color would you like them? Because they were just metal. And we said, I don't know. And he said, well, I have some red. Literally, it's that simple. And we said, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> There was no guy down there with a thing going, hey, give me, a, give me PMS color 127. No, it didn't happen. Um, he had red. Um, so we stuck with it, and it's worked out really well. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, collecting hard drive data. So we use uh, the SmartMon Tools package. Many of you have heard of that. To do that, all right, the data we collect is the smart stats off of that, and I'll show you exactly what we get in a few minutes. Uh, we collect it once a day. We actually scan the drives multiple times a day. All right, and there's a reason we're scanning. We're looking for things that are going wrong, but we keep a copy of the data for each drive for each day. And we've been doing that since April of 2013. Okay, so that's the data set that's out there. Uh, if you would like, the data is public. We publish it. It's on our website. Um, there's the URL uh, there uh, for you. You can download it. I think it's over a hundred gig these days worth of data. Uh, we explain to you how it's laid out, how you can go in and look at it, and we even give you some uh, SQL files to go and play with if you want to go do that um, to go test and do your own thing. So if you ever, um, if you're ever curious and you got nothing to do for a couple of days. Um, you can download some of that stuff. Now, what do we have here? I thought I fixed this slide. Oh, well. Um, date, serial number, model. This is for every drive once a day, right? Um, capacity, you can see that. And then we carry the smart stats. So smart stats carry uh, a normalized and a raw value for each of the statistics that are out there. Uh, there are currently... 255 sets you could get. Uh, not all of them are, ever, are used. Matter of fact, roughly only half are used um, that we're aware of uh, from the drives that we have. Um, and we collect all of that and we store all of that. So if you want to know what, um, you know, on Thursday, June 13th, uh, 2017, what the smart raw value was, smart two raw value was for that drive, we have that. It's in that data set. Um, Okay, I don't know why you would want to know that, but yeah. Yeah. An on button. Okay, I think that's a little bit better. I think I'll stay about this far away uh, from it, too. All right. Now, the most important part from the point of view of what we're talking about today is the failure button. So what's a, right, and that's what you can see, there's a failure value, right, in that record. That means that that drive failed on that day. Okay. Um, the way we do it, okay, is we actually uh, will scan for drives and when a drive comes up and it's not there, we go and try to figure out why. It either failed, or sometimes, a lot of times what happens is they took the system down for some reason, perhaps migration, data migration, or whatever the case may be, but we do get failures as well. Um, and so the only thing that gets marked there is a one for failure. A system uh, a drive can disappear from the data because, again, it's being migrated, Maybe we took a pod out for maintenance purposes or something like that. Um, okay. So what is a failure? Okay, and this is the part that's really important. Um, the first two are easy, right? Didn't spin up, you can't see it, the RAID array won't do anything with it, whatever the case may be, right? That third one drives people nuts. I'll be tired, right? Because it's... It's our educated guess from the smart stats values that we see 
and other things that are happening with that drive. So it failed, it throws FSEC errors, okay? Um, and we see it happening consistently. Um, we pull it out. And we'll pull it out, we'll mark it as a failure. We'll also, by the way, before we mark it as a failure, we run it through two levels of testing on the back side, which are basically nothing more than a quick reformat and then a long-term format, which beats the living tar out of it, that we have from uh, one of the manufacturers who shall go nameless. Um, and if the drive passes, then it gets put back into service and it passes both of those. So we're really confident that a drive has failed by the time one of those three things has happened to it. Um, and, and like I said, we don't have to use it. Um, now, okay, for those of you who are familiar with our drive stacks, okay, we have been recording the data, and this is the data you're seeing is through the end of June, right? We, I could go in and pull it through today, but it, it, I actually pulled it at the beginning of August, and it was no real significant difference, so I didn't bother updating all of these slides. Um, you can see the kinds of things. We've had 132,000 drives we've had in play, yada, 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 right? Um, the thing that's important is the failure rate. Everybody looks at the failure rate. He looks at the failure rate. Everybody looks at that. They go, that's the number I care about. I don't care about all of these other numbers. And there are two basic ways to compute a failure rate. And one of them is wrong. And let's see if you can figure out which one is wrong. Some people do it this way. Number of failures divided by drives times 100, right? Hard, easy formula. And given that data I just showed you, the failure rate, for all of those drives is 5.62%. Some people do it this way. Failures divided by what's called drive days. Drive days are a count of each day a drive is in operation. Right? Um, if it is not in operation, i.e. it failed and it's gone, it's no longer counted. Um, and that's the way, uh, and you can see same kind of numbers, right? Drive days divided by failures. But now you get a number that's almost half as much, 2.56%, right? Which one is right? Well, we use the second method, all right? We use drive days. And the reason is for us, all right, method one, that first method, assumes that every drive has been operating the same period of time. And that may be very valid for you in, uh, in a situation where you have five drives in a, in a, in a, in a rig, in a NAS box or something like that, um, and you want to do that computation, that's a very valid computation, right? We don't. We have drives in and out of this system all of the time. So whether it's a failed drive, whether we take a system down for maintenance, whether we put in a new system, another, when we put in drives now, we put in 1,200 drives at a time, right? That's what one of those vaults takes, 1,200 drives, it comes spinning up, right? Um, the lights dim, everything happens, right? Um, so that's why we use that method, because it accounts for the fact that we have drives in and out of the system all of the time. Um, so if you're ever on our comments and, and all of that kind of stuff, and people are uh, yelling about this, they usually are thinking the first one is, hey, why, why doesn't that work? Um, and that's why it doesn't work. And we have to explain. I want to make sure I stay on time here. Now, thank you, uh, just, just because other people have, in fact, taken all of that data that I talked about and, made, and applied other models to it, okay? So we have an annualized failure rate we create, and we'll see that in a minute, all right? For those of you who have ever been in the medical bit side of thing, biology side of thing, there's something called Kaplan-Meier, which is basically uh, a how long will something live? versus how often will it fail, right? And uh, the Simon Ern, I'm going to get his name right, Erni, okay, he's uh, from Sweden. Uh, you can see down there where he publishes it. Each quarter he updates it. We publish this data. He publishes it. This is a pretty boring little chart, but he's got a lot of other ones that are a whole lot more interesting. Um, but it, basically, this is the all of the drives we've ever had over time and the chance that they're going to survive after so many days. So one year, two year, three year, four years, you're looking at something in the neighborhood of about 88%, okay? So that's the failure rate over time. How long can something be expected to live? 
that you put in a drive today, there's an 88% chance it will survive four years. That's, that's the kind of thing that this one does. And he's done this, by the way, for all of the different drive models that we have. So it's kind of cool. Um, and the technique isn't very hard if you know how to do it. Um, so and a number of other people have done some fun stuff with the data, but this is a really good one. Um, and, and he does a really nice job of explaining it. Uh, measurements. Okay, so when you look, when you look, you come and quarterly we publish the drive stats. And like you said, we've been doing this for about four years now. This is everything we got. Here's all of the data. There's no hiding. It's everything. And each quarter we publish two, sometimes three different looks at it. One is a quarterly look. Tell me everything that happened in the last quarter only. The other one is a lifetime look. Given all of the drives we currently have running, how have they been doing since we ever put them in? And then the last one is uh, every drive we ever owned, tell me how it did over the entire period, right? Um, so you'll see the data. If you go look at the stats and stuff like that, you'll see all that cool stuff. Um, uh, but that's how you look at the data. Um, and so a lot of times we make a mistake, by the way. I can't, and when we have published a report, the first thing is the quarterly numbers. And people have short attention spans. So they look at the quarterly numbers and they immediately just say, oh my goodness, so-and-so's drive only had, uh, had a 0% failure rate. Oh, my goodness, they're a great drive. Oh, well, yeah, but there's only 20 of them, you know? And it, it's only, they've only had a whole total of 539 days of which they were there. So make sure you pay attention to the data, the quarterly data, in particular, we use the quarterly data as just a mechanism, like a vector. Is a drive moving up or down in, in how it's failing over time? All right? Um, and that's a, good, that's a good vision point for us to do. I will tell you, pulling these stats and doing all of the magic that we do and stuff like that, that's like a part-time job. It's like, it's like another thing we ha I have to do. Um, and so it's, we do it, and it's great. Um, but it's not like that's in my job description anywhere. So, um, it's, right now, on the other side, okay, you get some really good looking things because you start to get decent numbers of drives and decent number of drive days. So, for example, I know there's some six, I heard there's a couple of six terabyte drives over there. Um, that particular model, Seagate, which you cannot get anymore, by the way, uh, sorry. Um, that failure rate, annualized failure rate, is 0.87%, less than 1%. That's a pretty good number, all right? That's a pretty good number. There's some 4 terabyte uh, HGST drives that are stellar, 0.26%. That's amazing, all right? That's, that's like, you know, there's 100 drives, a quarter of one failed over the year. Um, you know, that's, that's pretty stellar numbers. Um, can't get those either more anymore. <laughs> we we bought. I know you can't because we bought every single one of them. Western Digital, who owns HGST, had in warehouses everywhere. Right? I, I, we sent guys under trucks and in corners looking through the boxes of hard drives, and we bought every single one they had uh, because they were great. Um, and then we opened up a data center with them. Um, <laughs> that's what we do. Um, if you know one thing about Backblaze is we are frugal. Um, uh, we started and we continue to use consumer drives, right, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, lifetime stats. Remember I said the, the stats, now I have stats and I go back. This is over the entire period of time, right? Um, a little less information, but you can kind of see that's the, the math we calculated before, okay? Um, that's a fun number, 7,437 drives failed since uh, we started keeping stats. Anybody else have that many failures? Right? Unless you're from Google or Facebook or one of those guys, you probably, by the way, their number is going to be a whole lot bigger than that. Um, you know, I, I, we, we crow, we have 600 petabytes, yay. Right? Those guys have, I don't know, 100 times that. Um, it's amazing. Um, so proud of what we do. Um, anyway. Uh, so what we did, I did there, is I summarized up for all of the different size drives. So if you're going down to the store, um, 
what Mike should be thinking about. Now, we had a really good run with two terabyte drives. All right, really good. Every single one we got in the place was great. All right, and then there was this thing in, in 2011, 2012 called the Thailand Drive Crisis, and we had to buy a lot of drives, and they were all three terabyte drives during that period. And let's just say that the drives were not as good, uh, and we'll leave it at that. Um, and but you guys, and the numbers are the numbers, right? Um, now. You look at this and you'll go, wow, look at those 12 terabyte drives. They're doing great. Remember, we've only had them for a year or so. So if you start to think about um, how drives fail, they do seem to follow a bathtub curve. So there's a little infant mortality at the beginning. Um, and then they, then they kind of settle into a really nice low rate for two, three years. Then they start to bump up at about three and a half to four years and the failure rate starts to go up from there. All right. Um, and drives seem to follow it. The interesting part about that is the infant mortality rate for us has gone almost flat um, at the front end of the curve for some of the bigger drives. I don't know if it's because they're making better drives, they're testing them well, um, whatever the case may be, but we're just not seeing the same level. We're seeing a really interesting, it's, it's, almost, it's almost indistinguishable from the middle of the curve now. Um, so... Um, so yay for the drive manufacturers for that. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, by manufacturer, everybody always asks, uh, which manufacturer makes the best drive? Um, it depends. Right? Uh, HGST, most of the drives we have for them, uh, with the exception of one, one model, are four terabytes or less. Uh, and that was generally before they were acquired. Um, uh, they have, um, so that number kind of fits that model. The early Seagates, not so good. The late Seagates, pretty darn good. Um, and we don't have enough Toshiba drives yet. Uh, I do have 1,214 terabyte Toshiba drives in the warehouse that are gonna be deployed any day. Um, so that'll help some of these numbers, um, but uh, uh, that's what we have. So you look at the failure rates, you know, people, everybody wants that answer. Should I buy Seagates, right? And there's, there's, I could divide the room in half, and this half is the Western Digital half, and that half is the Seagate half, right? Um, and you guys can yell and throw each other stuff and everything like that. And then there's a couple of Toshiba guys down in front, and, um, and nobody pays attention to them anyway. So, um, so I, we're, I'm not going to try to solve that problem for you, okay? The other thing that gets in the way is our environment is our environment, right? It's a data center. We treat these guys really nice. Right? They go in a nice chassis, right? They get tested. They get put in there. It's, they're air conditioned, right? We, we monitor the electricity going through them. It's all filtered and everything like that. I don't know if that's the same environment you have at home, okay? <laughs> okay. I'm just saying. Um, but this is the way with the data we have. A um, uh, little more, more stuff. Uh, lifetime. Okay, so for the drives that are currently in the data center today running, there's 98,000 of them, and you can see the failure rate, right? A little less than 2%, all right? Um, still, 4,300 of those mo of those drives have failed. Um, and and that's what we consider to be the most relevant thing. I can't go back in history. I don't really care about one terabyte drives anymore um, uh, because we don't have any. We just got rid of the last three terabyte drives like two days ago. And the only reason we even had them, um, the only reason we even had them was because they were in a rack. There was four, four pods full of them in a rack. Um, and they were in an area where we don't, we don't go. I mean, it's, it's the way the data, this particular data set is set up, there's like, a hand, there's like two or three racks that are just all by themselves at a corner somewhere. Um, and it's, and they're, they're caged and everything, and we were going to build out the rest of that at one point, and we ran out of electricity, I guess is the best way to put it, all right? Um, who would have known it, right? Um, uh, but they and it was it was too expensive. It was actually cheaper to go and have another data center 
than it was to drag more electricity into that existing one. Um, and this is the kind of fun math you have to do. Um, you know, so no, I don't want to go spend five hundred thousand dollars to have PG&E drag another, you know, hundred megawatts or whatever it was into that data center. Um, let's just go open one in Phoenix, and it worked out. Um, but these these happen to be in a rack, uh, one of those racks in the corner, and those drives just never failed for some reason. Neither they were in a little set there, um, but they finally they finally left. Um, we had a ceremony for them. Um, they will, uh, we'll even, we'll do a little blog post about them and everything like that, because that's the kind of goofy stuff we do. But, um, so, um, just all of those models, right? Lifestyle stats of operational models. Um, just so you can see, um, the ones that are really kind of fun, uh, if, you, if you stared all the way over at that right-hand column, um, which one's the best? Well, it's the 10 terabyte Seagates all the way down at the bottom, right? Those have been really rock solid drives, and Seagate doesn't make 10 terabyte drives anymore. <laughs> they, they, they skip right to 12. They made those for like a week, I swear. <laughs> and, and we bought them, we bought 1,200 of them, um, and we went to go buy some more because what we do is we run a sequence of things, right? Very typical data center kinds of things you have to think about. We put in 20. 20 is what's called the tone. It's one drive in each of those 20 different pods, right? And we see how they perform. Um, and if they, work, if, they, if they keep up with everything else that's going on um, and, and all of that, and, they, and then we'll say, great, then we'll build a whole storage pod out of them. And we, so we add another um, 59, because there's 60 in there, right? And then we do it again. And then if we're happy with that, we like the results of that, then we'll go out and we'll fill a vault with them at 1,200. Um, and, uh, and that's what we did uh, with, that, with the, the Seagate ones. But apparently, we took too long because they decided they weren't going to make 10s anymore, and now they're making 12s and 14s are coming. They don't, they don't, I don't believe they have any 14s yet. Um, so, um, so you, sorry, can't get those. Um, it looks like you're going to need... Uh, really big drives next year anyway, so uh, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Um, the other one that does really well is the HGST, about a half a percent. Um, you can see those two four terabyte ones towards the top, uh, which are really good and rock solid. Uh, mentioned the Seagate 6s were pretty good too. Uh, the Seagate 8 terabyte ones, we'll talk about those in just a second. That's a really nice thing. Um, because one of them is consumer drive and the other one is an enterprise drive. Um, Ta-da! Okay. Um, so I think it's important to understand what we care about, okay? Because it's probably, it may or may not be the same as what you care about when you buy a drive, all right? We care about cost. Number one, the rest of them you can gray out. It's almost that a month, right? Um, but that second one, as I mentioned, sometimes power is really interesting to us. So, for example, when we put in the Enterprise 8 terabyte Seagate drives, they, they were almost one and a half times as much power as the consumer drives. And when you're running on the ragged edge of the amount of power you have in a rack, all right, you can't do that. Because otherwise you have to, you can't put in 10 pods in there because 10 times you can fill a whole rack, right? Um, you can only put in six. And that is, that's not good for density, right? So power is important, but then Seagate uh, has a really nice capability in there called power technology or something like that. Uh, it's on the next slide, um, which allows you to adjust the amount of power that you're going to give that drive um, when we could get it in there. So cost right now for us someplace around 2.2 cents to 2.25 cents, right? Um, you can actually get a better price on that every once in a while. Uh, you'll go down and somebody will be having a sale at Costco or wherever, um, and you'll be able to get it, and it'll actually math out to be less than that. Um, but a long time ago, we used to buy drives at Costco. Um, <laughs> now if we show up and say at Costco that we need 1,000 drives, they, they don't let us have them. Um, so we buy now straight from the manufacturers or 
uh, close enough. Uh, so that's about what, the, what we pay, okay, uh, someplace in there. Um, the other things in there fits our usage. It, like I mentioned earlier, if we put a drive in now and it just doesn't work, it fails, and, and that happens sometimes. We put a drive in, we put 20 of those drives in there, and they just can't keep up, okay? There's something that's not working right in the environment. Um, we don't use it. Uh, why, why beat our head against the wall, right? Uh, failure rates do matter. So you saw really nice low numbers. We can tolerate anything in a single-digit failure rate, okay? Once you start to get above that, you're starting to play, you're starting to roll the dice really hard on your durability, okay? Um, so anything above a single-digit kind of failure rate, the lower the better, right? Right now we're running at about 1.1, 1 1.2 percent, um, and that's a really nice number uh, because it keeps the durability going. Um, and, and the durability is... Remember, they're sharded across seven, across 20 different things. 17 and 3 is a mechanism. So I can lose three whole systems, like I mentioned earlier. That's part of the durability that you do the calculation with. But if I have drive failure rates that are 12%, I start and rebuild times that are now starting to approach two weeks, right, on some of the large drives, <laughs> right? All of a sudden, the math starts to get funny. So we like single digits. Um, warranty, I don't care about warranty. We don't care about warranty. It's, it's almost not worth it for us. I know it's worth it for most of you, but when a drive fails, the time it takes us to go and fill out all of the information, put it in a box, send it off, hopefully get it back, okay? And they're going to send you a refurb drive, right, which I really don't want. Um, you know, warranty's not interesting. And then the last one for us is speed, okay? We, we're real, the way when we build that array of 20, there are 60 of those in a vault. I have no trouble accepting data onto those disks, none at all, all right? The gating item is, is you can't get me enough data. I mean, it's, just, it's that simple, yeah. Yeah, there's a, I don't have the slide with me, actually, it's probably on my computer somewhere, but we've seen it, when we first started, it was around 11 cents, um, and and then it's over the, over the 10 or so years we've been doing this, it's come down, and you can see, literally see drives by size do that. And they come down, and it'll start, and it'll go down, and then the next one will be introduced, and it'll be a little higher, and you got to wait it out until it gets down to where the, the previous one was, and then, it, and it, and it, they're just consistent. The only time that broke was during the drive crisis, and that broke hard. Okay, we, um, our drive prices through normal channels went up 3x. Yeah. My question was that failure rates at some point kind of So there's a, that's a really good point, um, and it has. And the other thing that factors into that is density, storage density in a given spot. Okay, so one of the things we've been doing over the last three or four years now is migrating from the smaller drives to larger drives. So I take out a four and I put in a twelve. I just got three times as much storage for approximately the same cost. Okay, now I got a bunch of four terabyte drives, but I got four years out of them. Right? I turn them over and they get recycled. I don't, they end up in a pile in China. <coughs> Wherever. Uh, hopefully not. Um, so that's a good point about that. And there is exactly that kind of math we do. Um, so, so let's compare. This is an eight terabyte drives. Okay? By, by the same manufacturer, Two different models. One's a consumer one. One's an enterprise one. <coughs> right. Uh, about a year ago, we did it. The failure rates in that second column. You can see where they were. And now you can see the current failure rates. That's within the margin of error, by the way. So you're sitting there going, "Hmm, I could spend a uh, 
$129 to buy that 8 terabyte drive, or maybe $159. Or I could spend $429 to buy the enterprise drive. I wonder which one I should do if I'm interested about failure. All right? Um, for us, it didn't matter. Now, for us also, let's just say the price of those things is approximately the same. Okay? You can't do that. I can do that, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because I buy a million dollars worth of drives at a time, um, okay? Um, so, but that's what we see out of the data. So if I was looking at that and going, what would I do? I might think a consumer drive because really it's, the failure is, is about the same. I will tell you a little difference that we've seen, and this is anecdotal. I don't, I, I'm never going to write this down anywhere, right? <laughs> The consumer drives seem to have this tolerance for things happening to them inside, like bad sectors that have to be remapped around and all of this kind of stuff, right? The enterprise drives don't seem to have that same tolerance. When they start to go, they just go. They don't, they, they don't give you a whole lot of notice, okay? It's kind of like, I don't feel good, goodbye, <clears throat> okay? It's, it's just an observation, and I think it's just because of the situation. I think I'm going to put a drive in a consumer system, and consumers are, they're not, it's not going in a data center. It's going in, it's an external drive, and you have it next to your thing, and you drag it around, and you bring it over to Aunt Molly's house, and you drop it on the floor. And, you know, so they have a lot of tolerance built into them. But if you're making the decision for yourself about what do you got to think about, these are the things that you, I think you, you, you know, might want to consider. Right? The warranties, of course, are different. All right? uh, typical enterprise one is five. The consumer ones are two. Uh, at one point during the uh, drive crisis, they were one year. Um, right? um, and and I, if they could have gotten it down to like 90 days, they would have done it during that period. Consumer drives are, are really much less expensive for, for just off the shelf. All right? Enterprise drives have a lot more features. I have the power choice technology. That's what I was trying to think of, for example, from Seagate. But they have a lot more things you can tweak in the firmware, all right, um, to make that drive perform that fits into your environment really well. Um, they are absolutely faster to read and write. Absolutely. Again, we don't care because that's not where the bottleneck is. There's The bottleneck is just getting the data to us. Um, you know, and we have plenty of network for that, so it's just a matter of waiting, uh, kind of sitting around doing nothing. Uh, but on the consumer side, um, they do use a whole lot less power out of the box, right? Uh, and again, mentioned more for the your failure. So, what is right for you? Yeah. So they seem to do quite well. Okay, and like I said, and then and then they get sick and die, and it's it's that fast. It's like it's it, sometimes it's it's hours. You'll see the first little it'll throw an F sick check or something like that, and then it it goes offline. You know, two hours later, and you go, I didn't even have time to look at it. Um, you know, um, they're just and the HGST by the way was it seemed to be the same way. Uh, in its behavior. We just thought it was an HGST versus Seagate thing, but it seems to be the same. It seems to be an enterprise versus consumer thing. Um, all right, Helium. Uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions and getting all of this stuff out of the way. So Helium. So any large drive now, right, starting at about the 8 terabyte drives, although there were some 6 terabyte Helium drives, but starting with about the 8s and moving on up um, are, going to have, are going to be filled with Helium. They finally got that technology right. It was They were trying for years uh, to figure out how to keep the helium in there um, because it keeps wanting to get out. Um, and, uh, and they finally figured it out. Uh, they even created a smart stat. The smart stats now to measure the amount of helium. So, uh, for example, HGST smart stat is 22. Um, and it's 100 is a raw value, is a value. And anything less than that means it's leaking. Um, <laughs> And they have a tolerance number, but they haven't told us what it is. Uh, but we have a handful of them running in the 90s right now, so we're trying to figure it out. <laughs> um, the Toshiba drives we just got in, the 14 terabyte Toshiba drives are helium-filled drives. 
and they have two numbers, 23 and 24, and they measure helium at two different levels inside the drive. Um, a high, uh, they call it high and low. I think it's above and below the ladders, uh, the platters. Um, and it's the same kind of thing. Uh, they, and it's the same, same kind of thing. They're actually, in many ways, still learning what that number means to them uh, a little bit, because it is a fairly new thing for them. Um, so what, do we, what can I tell you about that? So we have some helium field drives on the top. We have some non-helium field drives on the bottom. Uh, one of the funny things about the bottom, and we'll talk about temperature in a minute, uh, the eight terabyte air field drives ran hot. They, they did. They ran three, four, five degrees Celsius hotter um, than the lower end drives. And it's just, there's so much going on in there. Um, the helium filled drives run a little cooler. They run back at normal levels. Um, and that makes sense. That's one of the things they talked about. Um, and right now, okay, we don't see any difference in the annualized failure rates between helium and air. Right, which is which actually bodes well. That means they picked a good technology. Uh, they moved forward. It didn't cost them anything. Um, you can see the different failure rates out there, and you can compare it. Now, if this were going to be a perfect test, the drive days there would be roughly the same, and they're not right now. So, it's not quite apples to apples, but it's pretty good. All right, and there's enough data there to start to actually get to that kind of conclusion that it looks like the helium drives are going to have a reasonably, are going to be able to perform at least as similarly to air field drives. Um, they still cost a little bit more, or a lot in some cases. When we bought those HGST ones there, uh, we bought those like four years ago, uh, three years ago, about three, three years ago. Um, and those were about $450 a piece. And that was a crazy number for us. We bought 45 of them. Um, so we, it was the most expensive storage pod we'd ever built, um, but they're doing okay. Um, they're in three years now, three plus years now. That's a really good annualized failure rate after three years, um, and they're hanging on. So we'll see. We'll see what's going to happen. We're going to track them over time and see if over time the helium drives continue to maintain, um, you know, that kind of performance, that kind of uh, failure rates uh, with that. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, yeah, so we'll continue to do that. Uh, those are the two uh, eight terabytes. We, we have, um, I was going to throw the sixes in there too, but they're really, like I said, there were a couple of six terabyte uh, helium filled drive models, but they didn't make them in any quantity, and they kind of experiment with it with them. They really started to do it in the eights, is where it, that technology. And if you buy anything above that now, that's what's going to be in it, okay? Um, chances are it's going to have helium in it. Uh, interesting little thing, though, both of those models up there for the helium are, what's, are enterprise drives or enterprise class drives. Um, it'll be interesting to see if manufacturers continue to build large quantities of consumer drives uh, in that size. Um, the reason we buy the Enterprise one is, again, the price is about the same in quantity, okay, so we buy a bunch of them. Um, I don't know if I could buy, let's say, 12,000 consumer drives right now. You know, if I wanted to buy uh, 12 terabyte Seagate consumer drives, I don't know if I could buy them. I don't know if anybody would sell them to me. Got it. Um, so, and that's, that's, part of the, that's part of the way that drive manufacturers manage their channel. They might, you might be able to go to Costco and buy one or two, okay? Um, we, we did that when, during the, drive, the Thailand drive crisis. We went to Costco and Best Buy and bought drives off the shelf because we couldn't get them anywhere else. Um, um, and, but I don't want to do that to try to buy 12,000 of them. Uh, well, I was going to say there's not enough Costco's, but there probably is. Um, <laughs> um, all right, so enough about that. Uh, smart stats. Can you actually predict, right, if a drive is going to fail or not? So we track five stats by default, right? We did, we've been doing this for years. We talked to drive manufacturers and lots of folks, and I said, hey, these are five good ones, all right? And so we track these numbers, 
Um, and one of the things I did a few uh, a little bit ago was say, all right, if there's an operational drive, if I look at all of the drives that are running right now, how many of them have one of those, one or more of those attributes, right? Better, greater than zero, and that's it's either zero or a number better than zero. Zero is good, anything else is bad, right? And just so happened about 4.2% of them were like that. So then I looked at all of the failed drives and I said, well, then how many of the failed drives had the same thing, right? 76.7. So you, you're, if you're a stats guy, you're looking at that going, that doesn't feel like a very good predictor, right? Those five little stats. It kind of looks like it. It's obvious there's a really big gap in there, but you're, you're not sure. You'd like to see that number on the other side be, what, 95, right? A couple of deviations out. You start to feel good about it. So some really smart people, okay, not me, um, over at IBM uh, Switzerland uh, got together and did a wonderful little paper a couple of years ago. Um, and that's where you can find it if you're, and if you, um, if you're not good with math, it's a, it's a fun read. Um, but what they were able to do by drive model, this was the amazing part, right? By drive model, show that you could actually predict with that kind of certainty, okay, when a drive was going to fail. And that's pretty amazing if you start to do think about it, right? So wouldn't you like to know with a 97% degree certainty, three days ahead of time that a drive was going to fail? That's awesome, right? Now, you have to calculate that for that particular drive. It was a Seagate 4 terabyte drive, right? Then you got to calculate that for every single drive. And it gets one of these interesting little things of, well, somebody's got to have a lot of drives to produce the data to calculate it so that everybody else can use it, okay? <laughs> so, um, but it's interesting that the drive stats that they, and that's exactly how they did this. They looked at all kinds of drive stats that we had. They used our data to do this with. Um, and that you are able to get pretty good. Now, you know, look at the HGST, not so good. That particular model, I had three days out, 84%. I don't know if you really want to throw away 16% of your drives that are good. Right? I don't, I think the other one's pretty cool. I, three, I could deal with 3%. Right? So it seems like there's some way you can calculate this, right? Um, I, like I said, uh, this is, it's not my day job to do all of this stuff. <laughs> so we're trying to run a backup company, a cloud storage company. So if any of you guys <laughs> want to do it, we'll give you, the data's there um, uh, to do those kinds of things. But it is interesting. Now, I've heard people, by the way, talk about drive stat, uh, smart stats and say it's a bunch of garbage. It's a bunch of garbage. The different manufacturers, they just, they, don't, they just spit out numbers and who cares, right? I don't know. That doesn't look like a bunch of garbage. <laughs> Right, um, that looks pretty good, and and they were really, if you look through the paper that they did, um, they really spent a lot of time with it. Uh, last thing to last, temperature, right? Just for the fun of it, because everybody asked this question a number of years ago. Google did a study, right, and said, eh, temperature doesn't matter. You can just crank up the heat, turn down the air conditioning, you can go, right? So we wanted to figure out if that was true, because I don't mind saving on air conditioning. Right, uh, especially since we built the data center in Phoenix. Um, so the average temperature of operational drives for us is, you can see, around 77, uh, 77 degrees or so. I convert it to Fahrenheit because we're in America. Um, so, but, um, and you can kind of see how that chart is. And there's a handful of them that run at 45 degrees, but, um, you know, which is pretty warm, by the way. You can really start to see. Uh, but all of that is within the range of a drive. Right? And this is taken, by the way, right off of uh, the smart. It's the sensor inside the drive. So this isn't like in the chassis or us sticking a thermometer on top of the thing or anything. This is inside the, dr the drive itself. Um, and so, But all of those fit within the parameters that they give you of the operational range of a hard drive. All right, so none, we've never had a drive fall outside of those parameters, all right? Um, now, the interesting part would be failure. Is there any fa correlation to failure? 
So I broke it down by drive model because, once again, everybody cares about that. And you can see the, HG, the, the three manufacturers aren't even close, right, how they fail. Um, you know, HGST down at the bottom doesn't look like there's any real correlation. It could be anywhere along there. The Seagate one, yeah, maybe, but not much. Um, and the Western Digital one is a Batman cow. So I, that's what I see. I don't know what you guys see. Um, the, the, the fun thing is, is towards the end, which is where Google spent their time talking about, once you start to get above 40 degrees Celsius, you actually do see that bump up of drive failure, right? But we just don't see enough drives fail there um, to, to actually say that's what happens, right? They seem to fail in other places. It'll take a while, for example, uh, the Western Digital one at 30 degrees Celsius is 18% of their drives are failing there, right? That's not much above their normal temperature. So I don't know, I don't think there's any real correlation uh, between the failure and, and during a normal range of operation uh, once you get up there. All right, so you know, you know what we talked about, so I'll leave, uh, I'll leave it with questions. Uh, since we got a few minutes here for questions. Anybody got anything? Yeah. No, no. Oh, sorry. Uh, have we done any analysis for what file systems uh, and how they might affect drives and so on, right? Um, the answer is no. We use our file system. Uh, now I'm going to remember what it is, but it's a standard one. Uh, I can't remember what it is, but it's a standard one you, everybody and their brother would use. Um, uh, so we didn't invent our own or anything like that. Um, I, I do know some folks who have tried that um, because they do some really funky things as it relates to writing blocks and so on. But, um, but we just, the drive, that works with the drive and it works. So, you know, no difference with file systems that I'm aware of. So, uh, anything else? Yeah. So, so the question is, um, is if, since we started putting our numbers out, have we noticed that uh, the consumer drives have gotten better, have failed less? Uh, yes, we've noticed. Um, uh, while I would like to say I'd like to take credit for that, uh, because sometimes transparency is a, is a very good thing, um, uh, I, I don't think Seagate is sitting around you know, in boardrooms going, gosh, they just published their data. Uh, we better get better. Um, I also think, by the way, they learned a lot. The, the Thailand Drive crisis was really an awful event uh, for a lot of reasons, um, and they really took it. And they really got hurt during that for a lot of different things, publicity, everything like that. Um, so I think what you're really seeing over the last few years is just them making drives now with a reliable set of parts and so on. Um, I, I'd like to believe we had some influence on them making better drives. Um, uh, and we have good relationships with Seagate, for example, with all the drive manufacturers. Maybe they just give us the good ones. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I, but we have observed that. Yeah, that's a fair observation. Uh, anything else? Yes. How do they keep helium in the helium drives? Uh, that's a really good question. I, they, I, I know they spent a lot of time creating the case that goes around it on how they pack it. I don't know the mechanics. I, I was reading an article a few weeks ago about it, um, about how they did it because we got the Toshiba drives um, and the history and how it was actually, I think, Western Digital, which got the first commercial versions of them out. Um, but I don't know the, the mechanics, and I don't think they share a lot of that. There's this general notion of, hey, we did it, and we used the FlexiCore of blah, 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 marketing name thing uh, to do it, and, uh, but they don't give you the specifics of, you know, hey, we coded it here, and we did this here, and we plugged this gap here, and, and all of that. So, uh, I mean, it has to, it can't let anything out. Helium is just going to leak out. It can actually leak out through a lot of substances, uh, and, you know, so, yeah. I, 
so that's right. There is no flow. So they've had to reinvent the drive a little bit. Um, the, the question was is with air drives, air helps, uh, helps the heads a little bit there. Um, and helium doesn't do that because there is no flow, um, uh, basically. How do you get rid of heat? Okay. Uh, we, that was one of, you know, so those are the kinds of things that uh, they have managed to figure out how to do, um, but they can't lose the helium that's in there. They, they put it in there, it's sealed in, and it's not like they come around and plug in a thing every so often and add some more helium. So, so yeah, there was another question. So we actually wrote our own erasure code. Um, so it, it's like RAID, uh, but it's, it's, I'll just say it's like RAID, but it's different. And uh, um, there's, we, we did publish that uh, and how we did that, and we put it up on GitHub if you want to read it. But it is that same, it's the same kind of a notion of sharding something across, um, you know, X number of devices uh, and having to be able to use, have so many of them to restore the entire thing. Uh, and so it is that notion of what RAID is. Uh, we used originally RAID 6, um, and so a lot of the storage pods still run RAID 6, um, but all of the vaults run our own erasure coding. So, uh, anything else? We got, uh, how are we doing on? One more, last one. So, <laughs> and fun question. Um, how much of, uh, if you're looking at like S3, uh, you know, they seem to, they charge a little bit more than we do. How much of that is profit, right? Um, so I know they make a lot of money and Jeff Bezos is making more than our CEO. Um, so <laughs> um, uh, you know, now they have scaled to enormous areas. So that certainly adds cost to some level or another. Um, they also subsidize some of their other businesses with the money they make and, and all of that. Um, I, I think we like we do a really good job. They do some things better. They have a lot of compute capabilities and all of that. So I, I'm not going to tell you we're the same service. Uh, but for what we do, we try to make it as economical as possible. Um, and uh, we'll always do that. So um, and even though our CEO will be poor. So <laughs> all right. Thank you very much.